Aloha, and welcome to Books, 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 where we discuss reading, writing, and everything in between and beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Forsyth, coming to you from Maui on the Think Tech Network series, broadcasting from our studio in downtown Honolulu. The title of today's episode is Eddie Wingo, The Story of the Upside Down Canoe. Joining me today is Marion Lyman Mercereau, author of an illustrated children's book about Eddie, Eddie Aikau. Welcome, Marion. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Many of us on the islands know about Eddie Aikau and the meaning behind the saying, Eddie would go. I wrote about it in my novel, Under the Monkey Pod Tree. But for those who don't know this story, Marion, who was Eddie? Well, Eddie Aikau was a big wave surfer. Um, but even before that, um, no, he was a big wave surfer before he was a lifeguard at Waimea Bay and the first lifeguard at Waimea Bay. And, um, you know, he won the Tukaharamoku at Makaha and he was a champion surfer uh, along with his brother Clyde. But uh, Eddie is, is what this story is about. And uh, Eddie would go, you know, was coined by Mark Fu, who was also a big wave surfer who lost his life at Mavericks in California. And he said Eddie would go after the Eddie uh, professional meet at Waimea was called because the surf was way too gnarly. He said Eddie would go. So what's fascinating about your story is you were a crew member on the Hokulau when it capsized in 1978. So let's start with the history of the Hokulau. Okay, Hokulea. Um, Hokulea, sorry. Hokulea is a double-hulled canoe, uh, double-hulled Polynesian voyaging canoe. It was built 1974. Uh, the idea came to three men who founded the Polynesian Voyaging Society. They were Herb Kane and Tommy Holmes and Ben Finney, Dr. Ben Finney. He was an anthropology professor at the University of Hawaii. Tommy was a all around water man and also um, a great philanthropist. Um, he started Parents uh, at Children Together, PACT here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And uh, Herb Kane, I think a lot of people know, was a fantastic <laughs> artist. Uh, so uh, they started that with the goal, the objective, to prove that the accidental drift theory of Polynesian voyaging, that Polynesians just got on a canoe and maybe a storm kicked up and they ended up in the most remote group of islands in the Pacific Ocean uh, by accident. And uh, they wanted to prove that the voyaging was done intentionally, that they created uh, proper seaworthy canoes that could make these long voyages and that they could do it without the aid of instruments uh, because there were no such things as chronometers and sextants and charts when they were navigating between the huge Polynesian Triangle uh, from French Polynesia all the way to Rapa Nui, New Zealand, and Hawaii. Oh my goodness. So how did you get involved with the famous vessel? How were you chosen to crew? I, I got to meet Herb Kane on a Labor Day sail uh, from, it was, we left from Maui. Uh, to it's an annual thing and we left from Maui we came to Honolulu it's usually a five-hour sail but there was no wind and it was more like 17 hours <laughs> we were to see. Um, and I started talking with Herb Kane and he began to tell me um, all about the amazing vision that these three men had and in fact the canoe was in frames at Dillingham Shipyard as he was speaking to me. And the more he talked about it, the more intrigued I got. And I, I just knew this was a project I wanted to be involved in. And so I asked how I could help. And he said, well, you can help build the canoe. And I was like, mm, I don't know how to do that, but I'm, I'm you know, I'll, I'll have a go. And uh, the boat builders put me to work after rejecting me the first time. And 
But Herb said, go down there and tell them I sent you. And so I went back down and put in um, several hundred uh, volunteer hours on the canoe in hopes that I would be selected to go on the 76th voyage. So I was with her from September 1974, when she was just framed, until she was launched, uh, March 8th, 1975. And meanwhile, I heard people saying, oh, for sure, Marion, you'll be on board. And then um, after she was launched and lots of people started coming around uh, and we got further and further towards um, 1976, actually, it was even mid-75, they were starting to say, if we take women, for sure, Marion, and I'm hearing this, if, get louder and louder. And it ended up that I was not selected for the 76 voyage. Oh. So I went off to the Peace Corps. Um, in 1975, they did the voyage and they accomplished exactly what they set out to do with one of the very few non-instrumental navigators that were left in the world. Um, that's one of the things this canoe has done is there are many, many people skilled now in non-instrumental navigation. In fact, my son is, is one of the teachers of that skill oh. um, in the world as a result of Hokulea's um, amazing first journey. So Mount Piailug was from a little island in Micronesia, Sarawal, in the island group of Yap. And he navigated her down in 1976. And my oldest brother was a relief captain on that um, voyage. And my other brother brought her back. Oh, wow. So my mother was sending me all these clippings and I was very <laughs> <laughs> I was going, they didn't help build the canoe. On the other I hand, know, yeah, geez. On the other hand, they were also very skilled, much more skilled and experienced sailors than I was. Uh, so then how did you get on the second voyage? So then I came home from the Peace Corps in 1977 and they were talking about doing another voyage and my brother convinced me um, to try out and they wanted to be very careful about um, their selection. And uh, they pre-selected five people. Um, the captain was my brother and there was a first mate and uh, a doctor and Nainoa Thompson was going to prove his chops as a non-instrumental navigator for the first time, having spent, um, after the ret his return in 1976, he was with my brother on that, um, he spent two years in the planetarium, basically, uh, with Will Kaselka, his mentor, and had memorized some 200 stars and constellations and felt ready to voyage. Wow. And uh, and then Norman P. and I was on board as the instrumental navigator, um, which is why we did not have an escort uh, canoe, because we had somebody there that would tell, um, actually wouldn't tell, nobody knew except he, where we actually were, according oh. to where I know I thought we were. Oh, well, that kind of leads us into my next question is if you could tell us the story of the accident. Yes, yeah, so we left on um, March 16th, 1978 from Magic Island um, with, uh, you know, a lot of pomp and ceremony, uh, Ava ceremony, uh, Mayor Fossey and Governor Ariyoshi gave us lay and Loyal Garner sang, led hundreds of people in Hawaii Aloha as we left the dock at Magic Island and set sail. And... Uh, the wind was blowing about 30, 35 knots. The seas were about six to eight feet in the channel, um, but we went. And uh, about six hours in, I was uh, in the hale. The, the canoe used to sail with a, a little hale uh, hut, you know, in the, in the center of the canoe. And I was inside squeezed with eight other guys. There were 16 of us and I was the only woman. Um, and so we weren't on watch till midnight. So we were trying to get some sleep before then. And I heard my brother's voice starting to get a little louder. And then I heard him say in command form, all hands on deck. And the first thing I saw was 
uh, Norman P. Anaya um, with a 10 gallon bucket bailing as fast as he could. And I noticed the water was coming in a lot faster than he could bail it out. Mm. We were all told to put on life jackets uh, and sit on the high side hull to try and balance her out. And within probably 10 minutes of the all hands on deck command, um, this canoe had picked up a, a big swell and, and the wind um, on that, that uh, windward side. And we just, the 60 foot canoe went upside down. Wow. We just crawled up on, to hold on to the, the top, which had been the bottom of the canoe. And we made sure everybody was there. Uh, we did a head count. Um, somebody said, make like Opihi, make, make sure you're hanging on to the canoe. Yeah. Somebody else said, let me go for help. My brother said, let's, let's wait and, and see what morning brings. Because it was, as I said, about midnight. So y'all hang, y'all hung on all of those hours, just hoping somebody would notice you out there. Because nobody knew where you were, right? Right. Our state-of-the-art radio was underwater. Our emergency radio indicator beacon had not been properly secured, so it was gone. Oh. And um, our Gibson girl was not working. And so um, we were so far from Honolulu at this point, I would say probably about 10 miles, we could see uh, the lights of Lanai and Molokai. We could see right down the slot. Uh, but, um, so far from Honolulu that we, um, we, there was no point in shooting flares because the incoming flights had too much altitude, uh -huh. um, but we figured in the morning, you know, we would um, have that morning, early morning Hawaiian, you know, neighbor Island, um, commuters on, on those flights. And so we were just going to wait it out till, till morning. What were you feeling? What was that experience like? I was feeling very sick. Um, I was throwing up on the guy next to me, and then I figured I shouldn't play favorites, so I threw up on the guy. <laughs> um, but as far as fear or anything, I mean, I think, you know, when you're miserably seasick or, you know, if you've never been seasick, if you've got the flu, you, there's other than just being miserable. You know, oh. There's no room oh. for fear or anything like that. So then morning came, and then what happened? So morning came. Um, uh, I remember wanting to just sit down, and all night this 10-foot surfboard had been banging against the back of our legs of those of us who were down at that end where it was tied, and I, uh, I just wanted to sit on it, and um, so I did. And that felt so good because here we'd been standing, I'd been – shivering standing being the smallest member on board um shivering standing throwing up oh. and sitting down felt wonderful and then lying down felt even better and then i looked up and i see all the guys looking at me <laughs> and i realized that's something they all want to do um <laughs> and actually the guys wanted to explore with the board you know they they did you know somebody got on the board and took rounds to sort of assess the damage and um at one point, somebody actually paddled away um, and was, was gone for a good long time. And um, a, a big, big plane, C-130, flew directly over us. We were looking actually up at the belly of this plane, and we thought it might be our rescue, even though we were unable to call for any rescue. But um, Snake Ahi, Abraham Ahi, who was the one who did um, paddle off, came paddling back, thinking also that it was our rescue. Okay. Um, and it wasn't. Uh, but again, um, that person said, let me go for help. And, um, you know, who other than a big wave surfer lifeguard, that would be his MO to save lives. So was that Eddie? And it was the same guy that, you know, that night. And so the officers got together and had a discussion and it was decided that Eddie would go. Eddie would go. So... Eddie tied the board to his ankle. He had um, a uh, strobe light. He had a bag of oranges. And um, my brother said, 
you know, put on your life jacket. He said, nah, no need. And they said, put on your life jacket. And he loosely strapped the life jacket around him to put it, you know, over his head because he wanted to paddle on his knees. Right. As he paddled away, we all held hands and said a prayer. And um, seems like a few minutes later, five to 10, that a life jacket came floating back in the direction he had gone. Oh, you're kidding. I never knew that. So. Wow. Yeah. My goodness. So how long was it after that that you were finally rescued? So later in the evening, we finally had drifted into the air traffic pattern, which we had not been near all morning, with the exception of that C-130. And um, actually about three o'clock, a Navy ship had come towards us, turned broadside to us. We were, you know, using rescue mirrors and trying to motion to them. And, and we were looking at their stern. They were only a quarter mile away, but we are an overturned vessel in six to eight foot seas. So probably not easy, but it didn't seem that there was anybody on deck. Um, and so as evening came along, uh, we were, we got back in the air traffic pattern and we were, you know, very excited in the beginning because a plane would fly very near us and they'd shoot the flare and they'd shoot the flare and off it would go. And then there'd be another one coming this way and they'd shoot the flare and shoot the there and off it would go and we got to the point where we weren't very excited about planes flying near us anymore and uh they were just about to put the flare gun away i was holding the bucket that it went into and um it was just about past the nine o'clock which back then in 1978 is when planes inner island flights stopped flying and this plane headed towards and my brother and the first mate went, what the heck? And they loaded up the flare gun again and they shot the flare. And it went just like all the rest over us. And they shot the flare again. And that plane banked and circled us. Oh, wow. I got chicken skin. <laughs> yeah. And then it came down lower with another circle. And it came down lower with another circle. Oh, my gosh. And then it headed straight towards us and blinked its lights mm. back to Honolulu. So it was assuring us that they had seen us and um, also getting our bearings um, for a rescue mm -hmm. helicopter. So rescue helicopter came out within 45 minutes. And oh. I was up. In the helicopter, they first dropped down a basket. I know I swam over and got it, gave it to my brother. My brother said, um, can you read us? There was no response. He realized it was a one-way radio. He said, can you read us? Um, if the answer is affirmative, blink your lights. And the lights went blink. And oh then goodness. said, have you seen or heard from Eddie Aikau? He, was, he left the canoe at about 10 o'clock. This morning on a 10 foot surfboard, the lights went blink, blink, negative. Uh oh. My brother reported right then that that's what had happened. And um, the search then began uh, for Eddie. We saw another helicopter maybe half an hour later doing a zigzag search pattern. We, oh. and um, yeah, that search went on for two weeks. Oh, I was okay. in the helicopter. I was uh, one of the first in the helicopter. And um, the next day I was in a helicopter on the search. And um, yeah. And um, oh, you know, I, um, I, I just could listen to you all day, but the time is ticking away. And I want to have you read a little bit from your book. But before you do, I think I'm going to have so you wrote the book, a children's book, and then you uh, wrote a play. And that play, I would love to show a little clip from that play first, and then uh, have you read. So let's uh, have our engineer play that now.
Oh, that was gorgeous. And it was performed at the UH Kennedy Theater January and February of this year. Fantastic. All right, we have <laughs> four minutes for you to read from your book. You beautifully illustrated Eddie Wingo. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's always, I've told the story to so many people, um, usually in the longer period of time. Yeah. But, um, it, it always ends on such a downer, you know, he paddled away and we never saw him again. So I wanted to write a more uplifting story. And then, um, you know, several years later, adapted it to a play. But you saw the characters and they're illustrated so beautifully, you know, in, in this book. And so Tutu Whale is wanting to tell the story to Grandson Whale, who actually asks her. And um, so he says, um, Kaleo, grandson says, Kaleo, my dear grandson, no hello, no greetings. After he says, can you tell me this story, Tutu? No greetings for your Tutu before you ask her for something? Oh, aloha avakea Tutu Wahine. Now can you tell me this story? No pehea oi, how are you when you greet your Tutu Kaleo? No please, ke olu olu oi, when you ask for something? Away no ho'i kaleo. Where is your respect, your manners? Oh, I'm sorry, tutu, uh, tutu wahine. Pehea oi. Ke olu olu oi? Ai, ko umo upuna kaleo. Ai, yes, my grandchild, Tutu agreed. Do you want to invite a friend to listen to? What about that night a friend of yours, that happy spinning dolphin who always grins? So he goes over and he gets to bring Lele, um, who's, who's cavorting around the catamarans in front of the Royal Hawaiian. And then while he's watching Lele go over there, while Lele was admiring Lele, a long dark shape had begun to swim around circles around him. He started to worry. Uh, Mr. Mano, sir, well, why are you swimming circles around me? asked Kaleo politely. I was just wondering how come you still alone like that? You only one kid. You should be with your mother and father like that. Uh, I know, Mr. Mano, but they gave me permission to come and find my friend Lele. And Lele comes rushing in and says, what are you doing here with Kaleo, Mr. Mano? Lele asked in accusing tone. Nothing. I wasn't doing nothing. I was only wondering how come that Kiki whale went stay all by himself in the water with no Mara and Fara nearby. And so, yeah, Mr. Mano speaks pigeon. And they go off and on the way they meet they meet Father Elio, who is a monk seal. And he's a monk who has taken a vow of silence, so he doesn't have any lines. <laughs> That's great. And then there's Mr. Honu. Mr. Honu speaks like this. He just likes to keep his shell shiny and clean at all times um, because he knows he's, a, he's the chief attraction of all the canoes and sailboats that go by. And finally, there's Eva. And Eva is like, out of the 60s, 70s, she speaks like, wow, far out. I'm up here with a bird's eye view. And so um, they witness what, what happened. Um, and they're with Eddie uh, when he paddles away. And, um, you know, the, the, these are just amazing um, illustrations. This is sort of what it was like when we sailed off into literally into the sunset, although we weren't going west, we were going southeast. And there we are, upside down. Oh, boy. And um, Eddie is getting ready to paddle away. And uh, so the story goes, um, but it ends a different and uh, the way that that ending worked was um, I had plans for it, but it um, the story, the characters told me the ending. So the oh. story came through me rather than from me. Beautiful, beautiful work. 
And uh, thank you for, for reading that. And I'm sorry to say that's all the time we have today. So I want to thank you, Marion, for being my special guest and thank our broadcast engineer, our floor manager, and Jay Fidel, our executive producer. A special mahalo to our underwriters and thank you for joining us. Books, books, books. We'll be back in two weeks. Until then, read, write, and create your world. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.